Alhamdulillah, we now move on to a, a new section within the surah. Up to now, so far, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the beginning of surah al-Baqarah, after reminding us what the guidance is, what the pillars of iman are, what the three groups are in terms of their responses to revelation, the believers, the disbelievers, and the hypocrites, and then moving on to the story of Adam alayhi salam, his creation and his entrance into Jannah and then his sending down onto the earth and the enmity with shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, uh, he, he also tells us that in the dunya he will be sending definitely for surety, guidance, huda. This is what we discussed last week. And that whoever follows this guidance will be in paradise and those who disbelieve and reject this guidance will be in the hellfire. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after addressing those issues turns our attention to Bani Israel. As I mentioned in the beginning, the surah deals with a number of things. Surah Al-Baqarah deals with a few themes and the core essence of Surah Al-Baqarah uh, revolves around number one, the establishment of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because we have to remember, this is in Medina. When the Muslims arrive at Medina, settle in Medina, and they are amongst people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. So one of the goals of Surah Al-Baqarah to establish the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the second theme or central theme or pillar of Surah Al-Baqarah is the transfer of responsibility, of leadership in terms of divine revelation and prophethood and carrying the responsibility of propagating the truth of the message of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is transferred now to the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as we shall see later on in the surah when the qibla also changes in line with this change. So now this is the first verse addressing Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses them, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel. Bani is, you can say, plural of Ibn, children. Sometimes they use it as tribes or a people. So basically, children, sons and daughters, children of Israel. Udhkuru ni'mati. Remind yourselves of my favor, allati an'amtu alaykum, that which I have bestowed upon you, favored upon you. Wa awfu bi ahdi, fulfill my covenant to you, ufi bi ahdikum, and I will fulfill your covenant with me. Wa iyaya habun, and be afraid or fear me alone. Right? So, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He addresses, first of all, Bani Israel. He's addressing the children of Israel. Israel, as you know, is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yaqub alayhi salam. Now, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to address with Israel instead of his other name? This is to engender amongst the Ahlul Kitab a sense of responsibility, a sense of motivation because when you call somebody by their father's name and you uh, call them by the best of names and Israel some people the Mufassirun said um, it also means Israel slave of Allah or the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the meanings but anyway Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using this title of Bani Israel to appeal to their inner kind of motivation, to listen, to be motivated, to feel a sense of shame that you are the sons of this Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this great Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was true to his covenant, who was true to his promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who carried and delivered the message the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is connecting them to this name of one of their forefathers. Udhkuru ni'mati. Udhkuru recall or 
remind yourselves right dhikr is to remind yourself either to pronounce it on the tongue or to remember in the mind or heart it's inward or outward dhikr to remember to recall so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying udhkuru ni'mati remember or remind yourselves of my favor ni'mati and the scholars here said that my favor here means two things one is it's it's mutlaq it encompasses everything all of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favors everything that he is given as a blessing as a bounty as a favor to all people remind yourselves of my favor also it includes the favors specifically because obviously allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said my favors that i have bestowed upon you right my favors that i have bestowed upon you it recall those favors that when you were saved from fir'aun when we when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala parted the red sea when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took you out of slavehood when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you food from the heavens manna and salwa when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you over the rest of nations when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent thousands hundreds countless messengers amongst you when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the torah when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the injil when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent other books all of these favors remind yourself of those favors first of all these are the favors that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking bani israel to remind themselves of these are huge favors huge blessings so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is appealing to them before giving them any instructions before asking them to do anything the first thing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is his favors why does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want them to remind themselves or recall the favors of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it just to recall is it just to mention on the tongue is it just to acknowledge no here it means recall my favors to you and then respond the way you should respond when someone does you such favors be thankful be shakir be thankful show shukr to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfill his rights over you be obedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrender to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrender to the guidance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning a reason a big big reason why somebody or a group of people should be obedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why they should fulfill his covenant to them why they should be obedient why they should surrender to him the reason being his favors allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much and remember these verses yes ya bani israel but who's going to read these verses muslims yes it's addressed to them but it's also lessons for us musa alayhi salam is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran why Musa alayhi salam is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran related to Bani Israel for us as lessons to take guidance to learn from the lessons of his his stories of the events of what happens to those people who believe in the guidance in the revelation and what happens to those people who reject who rebel against the revelation so these verses yes bani israel but without a doubt the quran the whole quran is addressed to us too for lessons so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his favors to bani israel first his ni'mah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another part of the quran if you were to count the favors of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you would not be able to number them enumerate them they are unlimited every day and night we've mentioned this before his blessings continuously are showered upon us from the rain to the air to the weather to our breathing the the, the air we breathe the food the the family we have the clothing we have the risk the health we have the ability to move the energy without allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings we would not exist simple as that think of all of the blessings in your lives that's these are simply we're mentioning blessings that we can see 
that we can feel, that we can hear. These are these blessings. But there's so many blessings we don't even know about. There are so many blessings in this universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the whole universe, everything in the heavens and the earth for us. As he says earlier in Surah Al-Baqarah, he's created everything in the heavens and the earth for us. All of this ni'mah, shouldn't we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Shouldn't we be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's given us all of this without us having deserved a single thing. What have we done to earn it? What have we done to deserve this? Nothing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this blessing, has showered his blessings to those who believe and those who do not believe. Both. Without any difference to those who believe and those who do not believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling out to this ni'mah. And this is a very important thing in our deen. It's an important thing in the Quran. To be reminded of the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His blessings, his favors. And therefore that is the reason why we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who owns us. He is the one who has given us everything. He is the one who created us. He is the one who gives us sustenance. He is the one who protects us. Therefore, He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. This is a central core element of our deen. This is a central reason and rationale that's given in the Quran again and again. To be grateful, to show gratitude. Somebody gives us, does us a favor in the dunya, how grateful are we? If somebody gave us a lot of money or does you a favor, gives you a promotion, uh, puts in a word for you or whatever, helps you in certain ways, how grateful are we to them? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every single favor, even, even the word that someone puts in for you, even the promotion you get, even the money that someone donates to you or helps you with, where is all that coming from? It's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how grateful should we be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says beautifully. He says it beautifully. What, what need do I have of punishing them or punishing you if only you believe and are grateful? Subhanallah. Allah, Allah doesn't need to punish us. Does he gain anything by punishing us? No. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gain anything by punishing us? No. He doesn't gain anything by either rewarding us or punishing us. So he says beautifully, what, what does he have to do with your punishment? What, gain, what is there to gain for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By punishing you, if only you believe and be grateful. So Allah subhanahu, this, this connection between ni'mah, blessings, and our response, which should be gratitude, is the, you know, it's a core part of our deen. This is the reason of ubudiyah. Why should we surrender? Why should we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why should we be obedient? Yes, it's because he's commanded it, but why? Just reflect and think, like Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah says, when the servant stands in the middle of the night and reflects on one side, all of the blessings, all of the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, and then he reflects on the other side, what the human being or what you and I are giving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're giving him, we're committing sins, we're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we do worship, it's not fully uh, perfect, it's not the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do. There's so many deficiencies, you know, we're ungrateful, a, a, a tragedy befalls us or a hardship comes across, we start complaining. So you, on the one side, you think of all the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. On the other side of the scale, put down what we have given Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize the huge gap, huge deficit. And this is what should make us move. This is what should motivate us to try and make up that deficit. That I should be grateful. I should be obedient. I should be constantly in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should be, look, at, look at how deficient I am in respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings. This is what should motivate all of us. This is what should drive us, keep us humble. No matter how much I do, it's nothing compared to what Allah has done for me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses 
this as an introduction to Bani Israel. That remind yourselves, ni'mati, he connects it, my favors. He connects it, idafa, he connects it to himself, his favors. Allati an'amtu alaykum. Again, the word ni'mah comes, that which I have blessed you with. So remind yourselves of this and then do what? وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِي أُوفِي بِعَهْدِكُمْ Fulfill my covenant upon you. I will fulfill your covenant from me. And be afraid of only me. So what is this covenant? What, what is the promise to Bani Israel? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that. The, the promise is that if they applied the laws of the Torah, they would eat from above them and below them. They would eat from above them and below them. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 66. That if only they had believed, then if, if only they, talking about Bani Israel, if only they had believed, and the verse goes on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he would have given them provision, send them rizq from above their above their heads, you know, from above the heavens and from beneath their feet, from the earth. He would have showered them, he would have provided them plentiful. He would have always kept them in sustenance. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would have given them security. He would have given them authority in the land. He would have given them sustenance and blessings and he would have sent them guidance. This is the promise. You do this, you believe, and you follow the laws, the guidance, then this is the promise. Similarly, again, it's not just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promising for Bani Israel. This promise is also given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this ummah. This promise is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this ummah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah has promised to those of you who believe, shukran, jazakallah and do good that he will most certainly make them rulers in the earth as he, as he made rulers those before them and that he will most certainly establish for them their religion which he has chosen for them and that he will most certainly after their fear give them security in exchange they serve me not associating anything with me and whoever is ungrateful after this these it is who are the transgressors so in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a similar promise that those who what? Believe, amanu minkum wa amilu salihat. Those who believe and do righteous deeds. What will he do? He will give them authority in the land. He will replace the existing authorities and give them the authority in the land. A lot of the, a lot of the mufassirun explain this as political authority. It's, it's very... Straightforward authority in the land, political authority, um, <coughs> because it's talking about safety, etc., and other things. And also, he will establish for them their deen. So, just as there is a promise to Bani Israel, there is a promise to this Ummah. Just as Bani Israel, some of them kept the promise, others rebelled. So, similarly, in this Ummah, we saw the promise and it became true. The Muslims were established on this earth politically. They had strength as a civilization. They had their golden years. They had their expansion. And they spread the deen everywhere. This promise came true. We've witnessed it in history. It's already happened. But the lesson for us here, because many people today complain about the situation of the Ummah. Many Muslims are very disheartened, are frustrated, whether you talk about Al-Aqsa, Palestine, whether you're talking about other Muslim lands, Syria, or other Muslim lands, people are frustrated at the weakness, decline of the Ummah in terms of political power and strength, in terms of knowledge and practice, in terms of the de decline in scholarship, in terms of the decline of practicing the deen. People are frustrated. People think, subhanAllah, if only we could get this political power back, if only we could establish some kind of uh, authority. This is, must be the priority to bring the Ummah back, etc. But Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, he says something very important and, it's, and it reflects in this verse here. 
in these two verses. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, he says that the rule with regards to authority in the land, political strength, political authority, is connected to what? Justice. It's connected to justice. Meaning, those who are just, their authority, their rule will last. Their rule will prevail. Their rule will not be uh, demolished. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not take away their rule so quickly. He said, even if they are non-Muslims. However, if there is injustice and the people who are in authority are Muslims with the perfect guidance and the perfect Sharia and the perfect Quran, their rule will not last. So do, do you understand the, the authority, power in the land is connected to justice, not to religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not favor the believers over the disbelievers if there is a difference in justice. If disbelievers, non-Muslims, non-believers, whichever century, whichever time in history, if they establish justice, then they will be favored. Their rule and power will be supported by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Muslims, with all their guidance, are not just in terms of their dealings with people, I'll, I'll come to the details of justice, but if they are unjust, then their rule will not last. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He's reminding you know, of the covenant. And this covenant includes that if you, fall, if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you implement His guidance, then you will have success in the dunya and the akhirah. As a community, individually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still test you. Within that success, within that power, you as individual believers, whether you're from Bani Israel or from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tests and tribulations will be there. No one's saying this is going to become Jannah. But generally as a community, your, your um, decline and your rise is connected to justice. And it's, it makes sense as well because justice is what? Is treating people fairly, is having rule of law is making sure everybody is treated equally in terms of in front of the law. If you look at the Muslim civilization, historically, as uh, Noah Feldman put it, it's, it's a, a legal civilization, a legal community. At the core of it, at the center of it, is the Sharia, where everybody is equal in front of the law. Everybody is equal in the courts. Everybody has access to justice. If this justice is not present, and if you just look at Muslim societies today, it's self-evident that the justice is not present. People come to the West for justice. People go to non-Muslim lands for justice. Justice in terms of pure justice, equality before the law, transparency, and other aspects of justice, in terms of people dealing with each other, rules and regulations, discrimination, all of these issues surrounding justice, you will see why, who is in power and who is not in power. Who is weak and defeated and who is strong and in power. You just have to apply justice, not religion. A lot of people get confused. If we're Muslims, subhanAllah, we, we uh, all submit and we pray, we have Mecca, we have Quran. Why are we defeated? Why are we so weak? Why are we this? Why are we that? People get frustrated, but they're looking at the wrong thing. They're measuring by the wrong thing. They're measuring by the deen. Yes, the deen is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Muslims that those who believe and do righteous deeds, righteous deeds includes justice. Justice is an extra thing within righteous deeds. Ibn Taymiyyah is very clear. He says that the issue to do with political authority and power in the land and being established revolves around justice, regardless of whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. So this is an important lesson for us in terms of frustrations of young people or general Muslim community. And it doesn't just apply to Muslim lands. If you are weak in any community, 
if as a Muslim community you are weak, you're being discriminated against, you find yourself lower than the other people, you find yourself uh, oppressed, then have a think about justice. Look into our own lives, me as an individual, how just am I with my neighbors, with my family, with my friends, with other, other people, Muslim or non-Muslim, how just am I with them? How just is my community? How honest are we in our dealings, in our, in our mu'amalat, in our business dealings, in our social dealings? How honest and just are we in our dealings? So have a look at this, you'll find the answer. So brothers and sisters, this is, if we talk about revival of the ummah, if we talk about revival of even the community, it doesn't have to be about this big political entity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about any type of revival that improves the standing and strength and dignity of your community. We have to come back to this, that those who believe and those who act, do righteous deeds, and most central to these righteous deeds, one of the central things that will determine your authority in the land is justice. So we cannot simply talk about having political power or having calling for this imaginary power that by calling for it, it will come. No, we have to change ourselves. We have to have full Iman. We have to work. A lot of people don't even know what Iman is. Many Muslims don't even pray. Forget about righteous deeds. The fundamental pillars of Islam people are missing. How can we expect to have honor and dignity and power and strength in the land? So this is very important, not only addressed to Bani Israel, but a lesson for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you fulfill your side of the bargain, your side of the contract, and I will fulfill my side. I will fulfill my side. And in doing that, have only fear for me. Why does he say that? Two reasons. One is for those who may think by fulfilling your side of the bargain, your side of the contract, living Islam, uh, following Sharia, these are difficult. Following halal and haram, you know, being honest, being just, these are difficult things. Oh, if I, if I try to be honest in this situation, or if I try to follow Islam in that situation, I'm going to lose out. It's going to cause me a loss, whether it's, it's monetary, or whether it's position, whether it's fame, whether it's whatever, personal interest. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, That fear me alone. Then this will allow you to implement your side of the bargain. If you fear me alone, you don't worry about your losses. You don't worry about what other people are saying. You don't worry about the threats to your livelihood or to your position or to your interest, to your personal interest. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ And believe in that which I have sent down, this Qur'an. Confirming that which is with you, i.e. the Torah or the Injil, the previous books. And do not be the first to disbelieve therein. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again now coming to giving them an order. Bani Israel, the Jews of Medina. Come believe in what I have revealed. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by extension, believe in the messenger, the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? This, because this confirms what you already have. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again, look at this approach of first of all, Ya Bani Israel. Right? And then reminding them of his favors, ni'mah, before ordering them to do anything or before telling them off. He's reminding them of his favors. Then he's pointing out that not only if you fulfill your side of the bargain, I'll fulfill my side. You know, there's a reward for you. There's my side and there's your side. It's not just one way. Subhanallah. Then further to that, he's asking them that, look, believe in something not new. It's just confirming what you already have. 
this is this is you're from the same family bani israel you're from the same family this quran is coming from the same source that the torah came from that the injil came from that the zabur came from it's the same source the lord of this prophet is the lord of musa alayhi salam is the lord of all of the messengers and this is a very important point here although this is not the point that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is focusing on in this verse but for muslims it's important sometimes we forget that we sometimes make islam into a completely separate religion we sometimes make as though revelation just started with muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and with the quran and we cut ourselves off from all the past we know we have to believe in all of the rusul and the kutub we know all this but on a social level we sometimes make ourselves so distant so different from the people of the book or the previous nations we have no connection here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying look this book is simply confirming what you already have meaning what we have to remember and 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 bear in mind especially when we live in multicultural multi faith societies that islam itself yes it's the final version of revelation but remember even in the surah it begins with adam alayhi salam and that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send revelation so our view our uh, view of divine guidance is that it's all one it's from adam alayhi salam the first prophet and then hundreds and thousands of prophets after him right down to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are all believers those who believed in those messengers they are all divine books the ones allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them it is one long islam is not just with muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam islam goes back all the way to adam alayhi salam islam covers all of revelation all the messengers are muslims all the believers who followed those messengers are muslims not in a a um, identity sense muslim means the one who submits i'm not talking about a faith identity as in muslim jew christian no i'm talking about even the name islam there's a small uh, islam with a small i and a capital i islam here i'm talking about those who submit and it includes all of them they all believe those who followed the messengers they are all believers they are all muslims allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to them as muslims so this is an important aspect of islam of of guidance that it is universal it's not about different religions yes there are different sharia and people made it into different religions and and that's all there i'm not denying that what i'm saying is as believers sometimes we have to show the universality of islam of guidance of this communication of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through all the messengers and through through all the books and through all the previous faith communities there is a continuation it's part of the same family it's it's coming from the same source and it doesn't begin just with muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is the important thing so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying appealing to them that believe and believe that which i have revealed which simply confirms what you already have i'm not asking you to make a huge leap of faith i'm not asking you to just believe in something completely new i'm asking you to simply believe in that which confirms what you already believe in it's a small step forward and and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says beautifully wala takunu awwala kafirin bi why does he say this don't become the first of those who disbelieve don't be you people bani israel you don't become the first of those who disbelieve meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting them to believe first they already have the books they have uh, knowledge of the messengers they have the prophecy that a final messenger will come they have all this so you should be the first to believe you should not be the first to disbelieve again apply it to muslims you have we have the quran we have the guidance we have the example of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam why are we the first to rebel why are we the first to be disobedient why are we the first to not follow this guidance allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is appealing to bani israel here 
that you have the guidance. You, out of all people, you should be the first to submit. You should be the first to believe in this messenger. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَشْتَرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا وَإِيَّايَ فَاتَّقُونَ Then he goes on to why some of these people will become the first to disbelieve. What is the thing that prevents? And it, again, this is talking about that community at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them and by extension warning Muslims that one of the reasons why you will not accept is because you're going to put dunya over deen. You will purchase, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, and buy not with my verses a small price or do not sell my verses for a small price. Getting a small gain by selling my verses, in brackets, and fear me and me alone. Meaning don't give away this, uh, this huge bounty and blessing of guidance for a small exchange of something of the dunya. Either your position, either the loss of power, either uh, it goes against your self-interest, you have some loss to be made here by, by following the guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already warning them because he knows what will cause them not to accept, some of them not to accept this message. What will cause them is this um, self-interest, is this interest of this worldly life. And by extension to the Muslims, how many people do we know that for a, a, an ulterior motive, a political motive or other motives, business motives or some other interest, position, power, influence, money, government contra contacts, you know, uh, selling books, for all of those reasons, quickly selling the deen, quickly pushing the deen under the carpet, or lying about the deen, making up something. Why? Just for a salary, just to get money, just to become famous, just because their interest will be harmed if they don't, they think. So this is a warning. Don't sell for a small price, no matter how much money you get, no matter how much position you get, how, how famous you become. It's all a small thing. It's something small. It's meager. It's, it's finite. It's temporary. And not only that, there's severe punishment afterwards. And me alone have taqwa of. Fear me alone. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the beginning. That the guidance, who did he say? And here, after saying that those who sell the guidance for a small price, he warns them, Me alone have taqwa of. Build this barrier between you and the hellfire. Because by being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what we explained what taqwa means, is to protect yourself from that which harms you. So you, we protect ourselves by being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he's watching, he's hearing, he's seeing if we are taking on his guidance or not. Are we selling part of his deen for our interest? So we'll stop here today because it's quite late as well after... Um, uh, Maghrib, this, this week we changed the time from Asr to Maghrib. Inshallah, Maghrib time will go a bit earlier next week so we can go back to full length sessions, Inshallah. Just before I, I take any questions, uh, one point I forgot, the other part is um, this, this universality which I mentioned, all of the books, Bani Israel are being asked to believe in the latest book the final book, the final messenger. Again, this is a lesson for all of us within the Qur'an itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accuses some of Bani Israel that do you believe in part of the book and you disbelieve in a part. Again, this is a lesson in there for us as Muslims that not only we believe in all of the messengers, we believe in all of the books, but the Qur'an itself, we have to believe in all parts of the Qur'an. Not pick and choose what some parts and, and leave other parts. 
not pick and choose some parts of our deen and leave other parts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to take from these lessons and to implement them in our lives, inshaAllah.